From monsters and ghosts to otherworldly beings, join the explorers as they venture into the darkest realm seeking the truth to what goes bump in the night. Good evening and welcome to Explorers Seekers of the Truth, episode 39. I, of course, am Chad Charlesworth, and as always, I am joined by my best friend and co-host, Lesson Cabbage. How are you doing tonight, buddy? <laughs> I am doing good. How are you, my friend? Oh, lovely, lovely. <laughs> well, you know, I apologize for the late start, everybody. Uh, <laughs> as always... We are having technical issues, and you would think by our 39th, almost 40th episode, uh, <laughs> we would have all this stuff ironed out, but no, because that's not how it goes <laughs> for the Explorers Seekers of the Truth. Now, it I don't know about you, but to me, it seems like a lot more than 39 episodes. Uh, I mean... It's well, August of was it August of last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. seems like a while, but not that long. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But anyways, I before we get into tonight's topic, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'll go through the usual agenda as we normally do. Um, I just want to remind everybody that you can get in contact with us live tonight via the comment section under the show. On Facebook, uh, there you can interact with us, ask questions, add to the topics, so on and so forth. You can also reach us on our website at www.explorersgroup.com. You can go and see archive shows. Just click on the live shows tab. Um, you could contact us on a contact page. Check out some of the equipment that we use, some of the evidence, and you know, just check it out. Let us know that you you like it. And we are also on Twitter at Explorers Group. We're on Facebook, obviously, facebook.com backslash Explorers Group. And we are on Instagram, instagram.com backslash Explorers Group or at Explorers Group. I don't know how the hell Instagram works, but we're on there. And like we always say, we are also on iTunes. Uh, and we all, all we ask that you guys go on iTunes, uh, search Explorers Secrets of the Truth. Give us a five-star rating. Leave us uh, some kind words if you don't mind. Because we need to rank in order for our searchability to be increased. So we just ask that you guys, you know, go out to iTunes, rate us, give us a good review. And uh, we'd be most appreciative. You know, a few seconds of time is a, just a, a simple act of kindness that we greatly appreciate. And we also are all we are on YouTube. You can get through to, to that channel on uh, through our website. So, yeah. It's about, oh, yeah. it's about all I've got on that one. <laughs> Still uh, trying to work through the technical issues. <laughs> I was just seeing if you could do 10 more minutes on how to find us. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. How about it? <laughs> I kind of well, draw it. I drew it out a little bit because I knew you were trying to fix stuff up over there. I, I you know, I swear I, I sit here and if, if equipment can get messed up, it does. For some odd reason, mm -hmm. I'm sitting here with the microphone connected every, and I actually turned it on this time and of course can't get it to power up. Right. You know, it's not reading in my computer. Yeah. You know, it, it's, if it's not one thing, it's another. <laughs> That's how it goes, buddy. That's how it goes. But Hey, what can you do? Um, so where are we going tonight? Well, so this evening we're going to head to the deep South and take a look at some local legends in in the bigfoot world you know or you know some people also know them, you know skunk ape or swamp apes in the united states we seem to have several different versions of bigfoot so tonight we're gonna examine those legends that come from that southern part more or less the gulf states of america you know mm -hmm. florida alabama mississippi louisiana area mm -hmm. that's right but our first stop along the way uh took place in 1963 in the Honey Island Swamp in Louisiana. And it said a hair-covered reptilian ape-like creature was sighted in the uh, Honey Island Swamp. And the descriptions of the creature say it stands over seven and a half feet tall, weighs between 400 to over 500 pounds, 
the uh, Honey Island Swamp Monster, also known as the uh, Louisiana Wookiee, um, is said to be covered in a thick coat of matted gray or brown hair and swamp weed. Its yellow or red eyes are seemingly reptilian, and the smell it emits has been called the stench of death. Now, I do kind of, I have an illustration, and I, I apologize. I don't know where the source of this came from. I found it online, uh, and it was kind of cool, but this kind of gives a little bit of what the description is, the thick matted hair, and 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 we'll be talking about the, the toes in a little bit, but this is kind of a illustrated depiction of the Honey Island Swamp Monster, and they say that the... Uh, this primitive creature has long been blamed for the death of livestock and the mysterious disappearances of children in adjacent areas. And popular lore in the region is that the Honey Island Swamp Monster might be the horrifying product of a union between a chimpanzee and an alligator, which is kind of a hard one to swallow. But uh, And in the uh, darkly primordial swamplands that must look much like you know, the same now as it, as it did thousands of years ago, the existence of almost any creature seems possible, no matter how ominous. But uh, on the strangest legends surrounding the Honey Island Swamp Monster revolves around a train wreck, which allegedly occurred near the Pearl River in the early part of the 20th century. Now, according to this legend, the train was full of exotic animals from a traveling circus, which fled into the swamps after the train had derailed. While most of the creatures would soon perish in the harsh swampland, the legend goes on to tell that uh, a troop of chimpanzees managed to survive and even went as far as to interbreed <laughs> with alligators, which is kind of a tough one because, you know, most species of, that aren't of the same genus can't usually breed. Uh, but the result of that was a strange colony of reptilian-like mammals. However, this is impossible, like... Like I said, because, you know, monkeys and alligators, they get in a breed. But the Honey Island Swamp Monster is allegedly to have a foul stench, as other cryptids, cryptids you know, specifically, you know, in the hairy hominoids kind of category, Bigfoot, Skunk Gate, Missouri Monster, or the uh, Momo, I believe it, it's, it's referred to, um, possibly due to the, march, the marsh's uh, natural smells. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you really think about it, you know, warm, moist environments are, you know, ideal for algae, bacteria, and fungus growth. Mm -hmm. You know, add, you know, the decaying vegetation, the, you know, slow moving water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most waterways have a smell to them. You know, a swamp is a little more, you know, pungent probably at certain points of year and stuff like that. And, well, like you said, with the slow moving, basically not moving water, it stagnates. And with yeah. all the decomposition with both vegetation and, and animals that pass in that, it just, it, it festers and gets foul, especially during the hot months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you got to think about it. Animal smell. Mm-hmm. Like all animals, we smell, you know, most of us, you know, we don't notice our own smell, but you do notice the smell of other people. Right. Well, most people on a day-to-day -day basis bathe in some way, shape, or form. Right. So, you know, you got to think if, if there's an animal living in a swamp, okay, yes, it's in water, but it's not in there with Irish spring scrubbing <laughs> itself up every day. So it's, That's it's, true it's going to have some smell. It's going to have that dead skin, you know, hair oils and stuff like that. And with that heavy matted hair, anything that gets trapped in there, especially if it is traversing through the swamps, you get that, that, that stagnant mud and, and whatnot caked up into that fur. Mm -hmm. It's just going to add to that potency. Yeah, it definitely would have some, you know, funk. And I mean, I, I think with everything you always, especially in cryptozoology, everything always has the, oh, it smelled like this or it smelled like rotten eggs or, you know, mm -hmm. well, of course, it's not bathing. It, right. it, it'll clean itself, but it wouldn't, you know, be bathing. Mm -hmm. So 
the the monster was first sighted in 1963 by Harlan Ford and his friend Bill Mills. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were searching abandoned cabin spots, you know, by Ford uh, owned an airplane at the time. And deep in the Honey Island Swamp was where they were looking. And the friends, they had reached a clearing where they spotted the creature, which kept eye contact with them only for a moment before escaping into the underbrush. Now, Ford described the creature as following. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before, ugly and sinister, and looked like something out of a horror movie. Now, it's kind of like that description alone. It doesn't strike me as the average Bigfoot sight. Mm -hmm. You know, to say ugly and sinister and look like something out of a horror movie. You know, when I think of Bigfoot or, or, you know, Patty or any of the other, you know, representations of Sasquatch and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. I don't think of ugly or sinister. Except for that one movie. Which one? Uh, With Lance Hendrickson, uh, Sasquatch or whatever. But I thought that was, I thought that was a cool looking Sasquatch. Right, right, right. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and and you're right. When when you think of the depiction of a Sasquatch, now I, I've personally never seen one. I wish yeah. I have. But uh I I still kind of go with the more traditional eyewitness encounter reports where it's kind of a, a mix between a, a, a human and great ape, mm-hmm. uh, go- more gorilla with I guess with a more pronounced nose. Yeah. You know, less flattened and and broad and more pronounced. Yeah, see, that's a, that's one of the things. Like, I just I don't think ugly or sinister when no. I think of depictions and stuff like that. That's why this one kind of interested me a little bit more than normal. Mm-hmm. Is you know a couple of the a couple of the things that come up later, but also like to describe it as ugly and sinister. Right. So. Now, in 74, Ford and Mills returned to the same area on a duck hunting trip, and the two found several dead boars with their throats torn out along the way. Realizing that boars were too far from the water to have been killed by an alligator, they began to suspect the monster that they encountered nine years prior. The suspicion was confirmed when they noticed footprints, three-toed and webbed, around one of the boars. Hmm. Rather than have a second run-in with the swamp monster, Ford and Mills retreated from Honey Island Swamps at a fast pace, and later that night, the friends returned to make a cast of the footprints. Which we have a picture of, which I'll bring up here quickly. This is Ford holding a board with, I guess, several of the castings that they had made, and you could see the almost reptile-like three-toed, deep impressions on on the tips of the toes which i would assume would be claws um and i have another one here that i'm going to bring up which is kind of interesting let me pull this up into the broadcast you can see in the lower right hand side of that image there's a a, a smaller appendage that's kind of poking out almost like a uh i guess what would have been like the what do you uh Posable thumb in a way or, or or a posable big toe like the great apes have and it's almost like it's it's de-evolving from that or, or or perhaps it's just used as an extra means of traction in the swampy substrate yeah um how many toes do alligators have three i think i think that i think this actually this looks very similar to an alligator's toe or a footprint yeah, just kind of wondering out there aloud. Now, another man, uh, Ted Williams, claims to have seen the creature many times. He even believes that there are multiple swamp monsters. Hmm. I could have killed them, Williams said, but I didn't cause they... Oh, God, I got to read Deep South Southern. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, but I... Oh, but I didn't cause they didn't seem to want to harm me. <laughs> it only works if I do it in the accent, folks. That's right. You know, and 
he he took a uh, boat trips into the swamp, you know, to set his trout lines and stuff like that, and he was never seen again. So he disappeared in the swamp, hmm. allegedly. Allegedly, yeah, yeah. You got to say allegedly, or you know, somebody could sue you if he's still alive. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, after his death in 1980, a reel of Super 8 film showing the creature was allegedly found among the belongings of Harlan Ford. <laughs> and um, less is the technology work that we can actually try to show the clip now. Or no. <laughs> Let's hope. Let's hope. Bear with us, ladies and gentlemen. We're, this is this is a new feature that we have for the show. So we we have a clip that um, is supposed to be the uh, Super 8 film that Chad had uh, said, which was amongst, I think it was the Ted Williams belongings, the guy who had uh, disappeared. Um, no, it was I, Harlan Ford. Harlan, oh, was Ford's Harlan Ford? Daughter. Yeah, his ah. daughter had the, ha, owns the film to it. Okay, so what what we have? Uh, let me go back to the notes quick. Um, this this clip that we're going to try and play. So fingers crossed. Um, it was posted on YouTube, um, and I believe it was posted and broken down by Crypto Tom and the Crypto Crew, which I, I think I'm saying that correctly. If I'm not, I apologize. But I believe the original video was from the show Swamp People on the History Channel. So I'm going to try and bring that up really quick. And I'm starting it off later on in, in what Crypto Tom had posted, just because I want to show what was the most, I guess, interesting or most notable part of of that film so let me try and bring that up really quick fingers crossed <laughs> so this should be the film it's zoomed in and you can see the creature in the background kind of walking through the trees and whatnot so it's kind of interesting. And here's at 25%. They had zoomed in even further. Again, it kind of has that Patterson Gimlin film feel to it with that just kind of shaky, you know, uh, the old grainy film and whatnot was uh, hard to make, you know, make uh, right or wrong of what you're actually looking at. But uh, still kind of cool. That was the Super 8 footage. If that would go away, that'd be great. Of... Uh, what well, Chad was referring to. Just just to let you know, Les, I was checking it out on the uh, Facebook app on the phone, and it actually did play. <laughs> Yay! Hey, one thing went right. So, and yeah. hello to everybody who's tuning in. We appreciate everybody uh, stopping by. Paul, George, Gary, all you guys, everybody that 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 Paul, the other Paul. <laughs> so, thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate Larry, it. his other brother Larry. <laughs> yeah, Matt. Darryl. Daryl, his other brother Daryl. Yeah. So, you know, looking at that film, I, again, it's one of those ones, like you said, it has that whole Patterson Gimlin feel, and mm -hmm. it is very grainy. I mean, of course, you're, you're dealing with the technology from back then. So, film, you know, eight millimeter film is going to be kind of grainy and stuff like that. Right. right. Um, now, you know, you taking a look at it. You've looked at the Patterson Gimlin film. You've looked at several different films over the years and kind of, you know, looked at them deep in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Like movement and stuff like that? Well, compared to the, the PG film, I think the Patterson Gim Gimlin film was definitely a, a little bit easier to distinguish what you're looking at. This is another one of those subtle glimpses behind the trees you see the what what looks to be the silhouette or outline of a biped uh human like it's dark it's shadowed so you would assume it's hair covered um i've watched it a few times and i really can't i really can't make sense of it you know like i said it, other than it being a silhouette a bipedal silhouette walking through the woods behind in back in the trees it's interesting. Again, it was just found with his belongings. Was he filming a creature or was he just playing around with the camera and he was filming somebody walking 
through the woods just trying to see, you know, if he could pick somebody up. I I, I don't know. Or is it what it is always uh, thought to be? Is it just meant to be a hoax? Like everybody claims every piece of <laughs> video footage is. Yeah, it, though, I mean, if it was, you know, meant to be a hoax, he never released the film. Right. You know, it was released after his death and all that. It wasn't, oh, let me, you know, hoax these people by putting this out, you know, and, and trying to sell it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it sat in, you know, probably in a cabinet or in some box somewhere until somebody actually, you know, opened it up and looked at it after he died. Mm-hmm. So for it to be uh, an intentional hoax, it doesn't make a lot of sense because you don't get to see the enjoyment of your hoax once you're dead. Yeah. Or maybe they had planned on it and then they just kind of thought, you know what, what could be the, the outcome, the repercussions of, of that, of doing that, you know, and maybe they just thought, eh, maybe it's better to just let it go. You know what I mean? Um, you know, looking at the film, of course, yeah, you know, like we said, it is that that super grainy, blurry. It's at a distance. I just, to me, it almost, you know, I, I've read a few things where they um, say, oh, it's, you know, it's just like a ripoff of the Patterson Gimlin. If you watch, you know, the way the body turns at a certain point and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, it's very hard to see any of that. I see something moving, but could it be somebody walking in a, you know, ghillie suit or some kind of outfit that was dark in color and kind of baggy at that Mm -hmm. distance, you know. And and see, that's the thing too, is looking at it and uh, I I can't even, I can't even make out, is it hairy? Like, is it, is it fur or is it just somebody in darker clothing or, or are they just back that far enough in the tree line where they're just silhouetted? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely something that, it's it's possibly evidence but not anything you could use right it, it, it's really bad film it's just a blurry moving image off in a distance mm-hmm. so i definitely like i i don't believe it's a hoax but i don't necessarily know that that was you know, a, a creature or, you know, this Honey Island Swamp Monster. Like we were saying, it could just be somebody silhouetted off in the distance walking. Right. You know, just, you know, playing with the camera. I just love how all these people end up playing with these cameras over the years and, like, magically seem to get to the right spot at the right time to catch this blurry, grainy image. <laughs> I mean, at least with the Patterson Gimlin film, it was out in the open. Yeah. So you had a chance to, you know, it's the film quality is what it is, but you have a chance to see this, you know, Patty move across the, the film. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's kind of, it's kind of like that double-edged sword that we talked about. I think when, when Andy was on the show, we were kind of talking about this where, excuse me, um, uh, I guess critics or skeptics would always say, Oh, you know, what, what better person, you know, Oh, Oh yeah, you're a Bigfooter. Oh. And all of a sudden you end up with this, uh, 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 video of a Bigfoot. Oh yeah. Yeah. That that's believable. Like you didn't try and fake that, but on the other side of that or the other edge of that, that blade, if you will, why wouldn't they, they would be the perfect people to get that because they are the people going out in the woods. They are the people that are following up on reports of people, you know, Oh, I saw this strange creature pass through, uh, you know, my backyard or whatever, and it headed up in the mountains or I was up in a hunting cabin and, and this happened. And if they could get there soon enough, you know, with a, with a, you know, a recent report, why, why wouldn't they? Well, think about it this way. Um, you know, people who get the best pictures of big, you know, buck, you know, male deer with their mm-hmm. big racks are hunters because they're out there with cameras and traps and everything. And, you know, 
So it's definitely like that would be the person to actually get the image, you know, or the video or film, whatever you want to consider it. Right. I have a studio audience tonight. What? Oh, Matt, Matt, Matt's here. My wife's here. They're watching us on the phone as we you know talk here and they're <laughs> waving at me. <laughs> Hey guy. <laughs> yeah, so oh, that's cool. That's cool. It's almost like a Explore Seeks of the Truth is taped before a live studio audience. Yeah, <laughs> you, know? you know, I always say how I want to do it in front of a studio audience, and now I'm starting to regret that idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, technical difficulties will make you regret almost any idea, but mm. that's true. That is true. So, you know, this is one of those ones where I think if, you know, if people are interested in doing some more research, there's definitely some stuff out there that you can look into. I mean, Swamp People covered it as one of their episodes. Like, it, you know, it's a big cultural thing for them there. Um, there was, I think it was on American Myths and Monsters at one point. They did mm -hmm. something with uh, Lost Tapes, which was that, you know, you know fake docudrama type thing. Right, it right, was covered right. by them. Um, trying to think if maybe Monster Quest might have done something with it, or I was trying to find that out too, and I I actually searched it and I couldn't find it, or or maybe it was the Swamp Beast. No, no, that was when they did the Skunk Ape, not the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I do remember them kind of covering some stuff down that way. But yeah, it, it, there's some stuff out there. Um, Harlan Ford's daughter wrote a book, and off honestly, off the top of my head, I don't remember what it was called. Yeah, but we can add that into the show links later. Mm -hmm. So there are books out there and stuff like that on the Honey Island Swamp Monster. And I, I, I want to say that I remember reading uh, something on the Honey Island Swamp Monster in the past because the three toes stood out. Where mm -hmm. I remember somebody had found, and I don't know if it was Ford's or somebody linked to Ford, um, they had a pair of sneakers with three-toed footprints uh, fastened to the bottom of of these sneakers. So were they were they hoaxing these tracks? You know what I mean? Was it all you know an elaborate hoax, or is it legitimate? Again. I don't know, but they, they like the, the footprints Jerry crew found back. Uh, what was it in 60? I don't know. In the fifties is when mm -hmm. crew found those footprints around the uh, construction site. They were saying that they were hoax that he had tracks and, and, and they said that uh, Robert Patterson had a false set of tracks and, 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 and he was hoaxing footprints. So, you know what I mean? Well, it's like six in one hand, half a dozen in another. I, I think not to you know get too deep into it, but um, Andy and I were talking the other day, mm -hmm. and we were talking about like the surgeon's photo. Right, right of the Loch Ness monster. Of the Loch Ness monster. All these things always seem to pop up after the people have passed away, mm -hmm. or are you know, attributed to these people after they passed away. Like, oh, you know, the deathbed confession of it was a toy submarine with, a, you know, modeling clay put on it, taken at a, a close range. Right. Well, a lot of things are said in deathbed confessions that aren't true. People confess mm -hmm. to crimes that they couldn't have possibly committed because they weren't alive when the crime happened. But they, they confess to it. Right. Um, not saying that necessarily. I've never bought into the whole debunking of the surgeon's photo. Mm -hmm. I don't, because of it being a deathbed confession, and because it's somebody who's indirectly attached to the person who took the photo. Right. So here, yeah. like you know, saying, "Oh, the guy, you know, that we, we three-toed print sneakers." <coughs> well. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are hoaxers out there. There are people that hoax this kind of evidence or, you know, create a false narrative and stuff like that. But there's also people who want their 15 minutes of fame. So if you come out and say like, oh, you know, 
you know, let's say Steve Smith, so we don't besmirch anybody's name, but right, Steve right. Smith, who got the famous film of the, you know, Mandingo Night Stalker. <laughs> well, it was fake because he had a, a system made that projected an image and, and uh, you know, this and that. Well, he's dead now, so we can say anything we want. Right, There's right. No recourse, but now the person that says, "Oh yeah, I know for a fact that that was a projected image," uh, yeah, I helped them. You know, I helped them do it. Well, that person now is famous because right. you're famous as a disinformation person. You know, not to get too much into the conspiracy, but you see this a lot in UFO stuff. Is you know people that provide you know false narratives and disinformation on subjects. They're purposely right going out there to you know destroy somebody's credibility or take away from possible evidence mm -hmm. you know by creating oh well it was a you know it was a toy submarine with this you know clay done on it to make it look like this right right is that possible yes highly possible but there are other photos in the surgeon photo collection that show different motions of the neck, different angles of where the neck would have been at certain times. Mm -hmm. So did, and it wasn't as close as the photo appears of the, the iconic image of Nessie. Right. These are further away as it was traveling away from them and stuff like that, that these photos were taken. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these kind of, People that come out of the woodwork and say, oh, that was fake or, oh, this was faked or, oh, I, you know, we, we created the suit that was worn for this. Yet they can't provide mm -hmm. anything that looks similar to that suit that they claim that was used in this filming or, you know, I'm kind of rambling on that, but it kind of bothers me. That's why I'm rambling about it because people, yes, there are people out there that hoax stuff. There are people mm -hmm. that flat out lie about stuff. But a lot of times, a lot of the good or probably or possibly good evidence, after these people pass away, all of a sudden people come out of the woodwork with 10,000 stories about how it was faked and everything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you know. Trying to and write it, it off. Well, it, it leaves people like uh, Bob Gim Gimlin, who's still alive, kind of out there defending himself right, right. Know, against yeah. these critics. Like, you know... Could it have been faked? I don't believe it was, but could it have been? Yes. Could he have been an unknowing participant in a hoax? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But to say, oh, yes, it was a hoax, you know, because of all this stuff, I just don't buy it all the time. And I think a lot of times it's just an easy cop out. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree. People. It's easy to dismiss stuff if you can claim that it doesn't really, it didn't really happen that way. Right. Right. So now that I'm done rambling, Wes, where are we heading to next? <laughs> well, next we're going to be traveling over to the sunshine state of Florida. Uh, here we're going to be talking about the skunk ape, or as it's also known as the swamp cabbage man, swamp ape, stink ape, Florida, Bigfoot, Louisiana, Bigfoot, Mayaka, Mayaka ape, uh, swamp squatch, Jesus, these are tongue twisters, and Mayaka skunk ape, as a lot of the initial reports kind of stem from the Mayaka River. Um, the skunk ape is a large bipedal humanoid, possibly a Bigfoot, reported in the southeastern United States. Uh, and, and like Chad said uh, earlier, too, is also reported in North and South Carolina uh, and Georgia, I think. But most of the... Uh, the majority of the reports come from Florida, the F Florida Everglades. Um, it has thick black fur with glowing red eyes. Boy, very similar to the description of the uh, Honey Island monster. I almost drew a blank there. I almost forgot, like, what the hell was the last one we just talked about? That's, that's how exhausted I am right now. Um, it's a large bipedal humanoid, um, and I already read that. Uh, unusual for most primates because most primates lack a and i'm probably uh gonna butcher this uh a tapetum lycidium 
which is the layer of tissue behind the retina that reflects light, basically what produces eye shine in most okay. non-primate animals. Uh, most primates don't, not that they don't have it, it's not as prominent as most other mammals. Um, but they think that's what produces the glowing red eyes. Uh, the skunk ape's most obvious character is its terrible odor. And again, that kind of holds suit for all the Sasquatch. Um, are you having another conversation there? Uh -huh. You're talking to the live audience. Um, yes. <laughs> but that, that kind of holds true for the rest of the, the uh, Sasquatch um, characteristics is the, the stink, the smell. Um, which, you know, kind of gives it its name, Skunk Ape. Um, the first well, ever sighting... Huh, go ahead. Well, no, I was just kind of going back to the earlier point of, you know, everything has a smell. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, the longer these things are exposed to the elements, mud, dirt, decaying, you know, matter, mm -hmm. you know, it... it the whole smell thing is just odd to me. Like everybody always, Oh, it has this horrible smell. Yeah. So does a wet dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, know. that's true though, because the, the, and with the matted fur and everything like that, that just, that traps all that smell. And, and a lot of the reports that they talk about that sulfuric eggy kind of BO, I guess. Yeah. I I've actually smelled that a few times and I, and I don't remember what, what uh, show we talked about it on. I think maybe it was Sasquatch on the farm. Um, when I was out with my dog a few times this past uh, fall, I was going down where the old reservoir was on an old train track and in a few spots. And ironically, these spots were very close to um, glacier deposits of, of the glacier stone the rocky mm -hmm. outcrops, the and and there there are little cave systems that go down between because these these rocks are massive. I mean, a lot of these stone and, and stone piles are are they dwarf most houses around here. And I was walking past a few of these outcrops, and I just smelled this funk. It it was very sulfur with like. I don't want to say death. It, like it didn't smell like something dead. It was it was like a stinky old man with with an egg smell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's the best. I, mean, I, I didn't smell dog or like a lot of people. Oh, wet dog. I didn't smell that. I smelled. But again, I don't know what the hell it was. I don't know what I was smelling. I didn't see the creature. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it was just the smell I smelled. Yeah, I mean, could it have been a, you know, a pool of water? Yeah, you know, that something fell into, you know, start decomposing, you have vegetation decomposing, you know, is it a specific, you know, plant or something that gives off that smell? Could be. And well, I mean, we're in the cold, the cold region up. Well, I am, you aren't anymore, but I'm in the cold region up here and we have, they call them sulfur rivers because of all mm -hmm. the, the, the discoloration from the, the mines and whatnot, the rivers get that rusty color to them. And a lot of them, just smell you, you smell that sul sulfur smell so you're right because that those tracks run parallel to the river i'm up above the river so maybe there was just a couple areas where it would gust up through a little channel in the in the hillside and i'm smelling that it it's possible but the yeah. areas where i smelled it the most i wasn't really that close to the river it was just weird i was more it was more these for lack of better terms these cave systems or these outcroppings um, that I smelled it. Dog well, didn't take any notice to it, though. Yeah. Well, think about that. Like you said, these caves and stuff like that. You know, during storms and stuff like that, is there water running into those caves and the, you know, plant matter that has been washed down also or, you know, other animals that may live in them and use them as a habitat are now mixing with that, water that's pooled in there the vegetation that's pooled in there creating that smell yeah. you know it's odd like a dog wouldn't you know dogs are so interested in smells yeah you know yeah. so something he like that he didn't pay yeah. any mind so but and again to your point the water could be sitting in there yeah that's that's true could be breaking down it could be these little pockets you know that aren't exposed to the sun so they're sitting longer before they evaporate or it could be a 
a bedding area for one of these creatures. And again, this is just, this is an out there theory, you know, mm -hmm. it could be a bedding site and maybe the creature wasn't in there, but he was there and it was just a little bit of stink remaining. And because one or two of the areas were very powerful, but a lot of them, it was just a faint whiff. So either one was around and it's traveling and maybe it was following me. If, if it was something, you know, was it following me? Because a lot of reports that I had uh, read, these things parallel people as they go through the woods or wherever they're traversing. I don't know. Could be. I don't know. And I just want to say to everybody who's commenting, I apologize for... Oh, there you go. There's your puppy. For whatever reason, uh, the the Be Live yeah. interface is not letting me respond. I've been trying to write back to a couple of you guys in... in uh, response to your comments and it's it's not letting me send it so i apologize not that i'm not trying to respond or leave you guys just kind of floating there i just can't do it and there is chad's new little pup now what what kind of dog is he again uh red bone coon hound oh he is cute what's yeah, his name he looks like a big weenie dog um it went from dog to boss <laughs> boss dog <laughs> I wanted to name him Dog after the Jonah Hex dog that he just called Dog. He never actually gave it a name. He just was like Dog. Yeah, there you go. So, but it, it, you keep yelling Dog and the other dog just looks at you like, I, I'm not doing nothing. <laughs> All right. All right. Back to the topic. The first ever sightings of the skunk ape were reported throughout the uh, 60s and the 70s. And in autumn of 1974, many reports were filed in the uh, Dade County, Florida. Uh, 26 years later, in the autumn of 2000, uh, the police of Sarasota County, Florida, received a letter from an anonymous woman. With the letter uh, were two attached photographs of what the woman said was an escaped orangutan who had been stealing apples from her back porch for three nights. These photos were later found to be taken near the uh, Mayaka River, again, where a lot of these reports had, had surfaced. After the images were released to the public, cryptid enthusiasts dubbed the creature in the photograph the Mayaka Skunk Ape. And I know Lauren Coleman took a lot of interest in this, and he actually writes about it in his book, uh, Bigfoot, The True Story of Apes in America. Good book, by the way. Um, I do have a picture well, one of the of the two pictures, and I'm sure a lot of you guys out there have already seen this. It's been floating around for a long time, but this is kind of cool. And one of the things that that really stood out um, is that the woman referred to it as a great ape, an orangutan or a, or a chimpanzee. And she didn't go for the, oh, it was a Bigfoot. It was a Bigfoot. She went right to the most logical and orangutan, because honestly, looking at it, this photograph and uh, other photographs of orangutans, it, it does look like an older orangutan to me. And again, I could be wrong, uh, but that's what it looks like. And like we talked about before and what is going on right now with Hurricane Michael, Florida gets pummeled, pummeled with tropical storms. Lots and lots of damage, lots and lots of uh, debris that just destroys everything. So it's not unlikely that a lot of zoo exhibits lose a lot of their um, a lot a lot of their animals in general. And I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that there were like private collectors or people that had these these animals on their on their personal properties. Storms roll in, their their facilities get damaged, they're out in the loose. And what better place to escape to than the Everglades, where a lot of these sightings are reported? It, it would probably be the closest thing to where their um, original habitat would 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 be like, you know, like the the jungles of Africa and whatnot. So, well, and I mean knowing like the um, invasive species in Florida and the Everglades and stuff like that, where people are getting these pets, you know, snakes and, and different types of monitors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then they're just, they get too big and they just take them out so far 
and let him go. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you have these gigantic pythons and, you know, there was a story, I think it was like three weeks ago of a, what they believed was like a Chinese monitor that grows to be about seven foot. That was like terrorizing this family in their backyard. Like it was stalking them in Florida in their backyard. Mm -hmm. It would come up and try to eat out of their backyard. They would like come up when they were out and start running towards them. Oh my God. So, yeah. You know, and that, I mean, that's not um, a primate, but people do that with dogs. They take them out in the woods and they let them out of the car and then they take off in the car. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people with monkeys, chimps, apes, stuff like that, you know, between weather and maybe just, hey it's gotten too big i can't control it let me take it out here and just you know release it don't yeah. you know i think looking at that that photo to me it's always just looked like a known species mm -hmm. you know an orangutan yeah, no, something like that it, it it's interesting you know because if it isn't then what is it you know where where did it come from? Where did it go? Where did it come from, Cotton Eye Joe? <laughs> yeah. Well, what would be yeah. interesting? Now, now again, these were anonymously sent in. They don't know who who had them because actually, I think um, in in Coleman's book, it, it did say that they received an unusual letter addressed to the animal sheriff's services of the the sheriff's office, uh, but it, there was no no postmark, like there was no return. Ad return address so they weren't able to find where the person's residence was so it would have been interesting to be able to go to their backyard and uh measure the trees or the the, mm -hmm. the bushes that were around it to get an idea of of the height because although male orangutans do get massive in in girth mm -hmm. um i don't think they're really that tall when they stand on their hind legs i know gorillas can get pretty tall but orangutans i don't think are quite that tall i am trying to recall the one that i met face to face at the zoo was sitting down so it's hard to kind of give you an idea of its actual height but i mean it was big uh -huh. i don't think it was taller than me in any you know way shape or form but it was a you know thick body big face long arms smell yeah. kind of funny well just doing a quick search online it looks like a a, a large like a, a full-grown male is only about four and a half feet tall yeah so I, that sounds yeah you know, yeah kind of what i would think i mean yeah i i i would just uh seeing as most of the other reports of bigfoot creatures are six seven plus seeing a four and a half i mean what is what's the height to be considered a dwarf uh four foot, four foot four, nine and is the cutoff or nine four nine so yeah i mean if you if you would see that orangutan i don't think you would you know what i mean it wouldn't be like oh my god a bigfoot unless you think it's a a, a baby one or something well and that's that's also something that interests me different environments you know, we, we talk, you know, like tonight we're talking about like more Southern Bigfoot, mm -hmm. you know, but you read the different stories, the different body types, you know, heights and stuff like that over the years, you know, like down there because of the environment, could they be shorter? You know, it's that Foster's rule. Could be. I mean, if you think yeah, about the, the Everglades are, are swampy, thick brush. I mean, if you're eight feet tall, I mean, think about it. I mean, we're we're over six feet tall. It's hard for us to get through thick brush. Mm -hmm. If you're even bigger than we are in height and, and, and girth, it's going to be next to impossible to to get through a lot of that thick underbrush. So if you are, and, and what what's that? Uh, it's escaping uh, my mind right now. When certain animals are kind of, stuck in in an area it's that dwarfism it's foster's rule that yeah foster's, foster's rule that's what rule. i knew it was foster something but yeah it's um 
island and it's usually right and it's more it's more uh common in in islands yeah you know smaller land masses but i guess if you figure if you're in the everglades and and you're you're kind of quarantined to just the swamp well then the, the everglades are a huge area so i don't know i don't know yeah i mean it, it's all speculation but i mean it's one of those things like you could you know because of the yes it is you know miles and miles of area but to exist and adapt and be, thrive in that area, it certain things would have to be smaller. Certain things would have to be bigger. Mm -hmm. Well, George has a good a good point there that he has in the comments. All food sources are on the ground down in that area, and and that's kind of kind of a good point. Like I would assume most of them would spend their time foraging, kind of being down low, mm -hmm. rather than needing to be up high. You know what I mean for for reaching. Yeah. And if they needed to get up there, I mean, they could climb. They don't have to exactly stand and, you know. Well, so yeah, I mean. That's a good point. Yeah. It, I mean, it's all speculation, but it's always kind of interesting to kind of walk that out and see, you know, some ideas of why and, you know, get people's opinions on it. Because it always strikes me as like, you know, they report the ones in Texas as being tall and thinner mm -hmm. because of the environment. You know, right. ones in the Pacific Northwest, you hear reports, oh, between six foot and nine to ten foot. True. You know, tall. Well, yeah. the trees out there are, you know, straight up and down, usually huge. They don't, as far as I know, they don't have like the mountain laurel and stuff like we do in PA and stuff. Right. So environmentally... That's why I always love when people say, oh, this is a possible Bigfoot, you know, area. And it's like, yeah, do you see that laurel bush there? I'm 6'2", 240-some pounds. I can't fit through that laurel bush. You're <laughs> going to tell me a 6-foot to 7-foot Bigfoot, which would probably weigh 350 to 500 pounds walking upright can make it through there? That's right. why you have to look for those game areas that have the high arches to them to even for me to even consider your you know looking at something that could possibly be used by bigfoot to move about the woods that's true well back to the topic like we were talking about with uh, the identification most sightings of the skunk ape like bigfoot sightings can be uh dismissed as black bear sightings and it's entirely possible for a black bear to stand upright which we all know they could they could get up on their hind legs and making it appear like uh, an entirely different animal you know that misidentification mm. bears are also known to rummage through garbage bins which could possibly explain the smell you know associated with with the creature which again i i think even if a bear goes through those swamps you know what i mean I, hell when i take my dog out and and he gets himself into a swampy area that like that stagnity mud and whatnot he reeks you know, it's like instantly you got to take him to the groomer to get to get cleaned up because he's just disgusting. So Im imagine an animal that's out there in a 24 seven. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to necessarily rummage through garbage cans or anything like that. But just being in that stagnant, swampy slop, yeah. of course, it's going to smell. Well, and think about how we treat the environment. I mean, some of those swamps are probably, you know, have been used over the years as dumping grounds for human waste, garbage, oh, you know, sure. stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we don't necessarily treat the environment all that well. And, you know, so things are going to decompose and smell. Mm -hmm. Well, the United States National Park Service considers the skunk ape to be a hoax. Uh, pretty much every every national service or any kind of government funded uh service thinks the same thing um but to start getting into some i guess evidence on october 28th in 2013 a video titled i think i saw a skunk ape please help was uploaded to youtube it depicts a hairy a large hairy uh humanoid creature crouching in the water and pulling bark off a tree with very little effort um again this is something that is very uh, common with bear, especially going after termite mounds, ant, ant burrows or whatever, ant mounds, colonies, whatever the hell the term is. Um, it's a common thing, you know, and I'm going to again, I'm going to try and play this video. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, this works as well. 
Um, when when you watch the video, um, you'll see the creature at the tree, kind of crouched down. My first impression while looking at it, it looks like a gorilla. At first, I thought, oh, it's probably an escaped chimp. But if you look at the back of the head, it definitely has that that conical skull in the back. It is very pronounced. You'll see it in the video. Um, and I still think it's a gorilla, but towards the end, and it's just a very short clip where you see the creature stand up. And I'll try and freeze the the video when it gets to that point. So, you know, here here's to wishful thinking. Um, the legs appear to be more of uh, a femur, a longer femur than what a gorilla has. Uh, you can't really see the calf area because it is submerged uh, in, in the swamp that it's, you know, messing around in. Very ape-like behavior. So I'm going to pull that up. And again, fingers crossed that this works. Um, I'll play it if I could get it to go back to the beginning. I'll play it from the beginning. Let's see if I could get this. All right. Here it is. Now, again, like with most of them, that it's pretty shaky, but you'll see in the center of the screen in the background, you can see the dark object kind of like messing around one of those trees in there. Like I said, it has that very, very domed kind of pointed conical head. And at first you could probably mistake that. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. It's part of that clip. You could definitely see how you could think it was a bear, but just the way it was tossed in that, like it almost like held it, looked at it, just eh, tossed it, nothing on it. That was in the video. <laughs> you know, you would think with all the uh, advancements in technology, we would get a non shaky video that doesn't have the autofocus jerking around. But again, look at how many technical difficulties we have on this show. <laughs> Yeah, 39 episodes into it and things yeah, still and don't everyone, work everyone had something. Chuck asks, have either of us seen a Bigfoot? No, unfortunately, we have not. Chuck, if you go back and watch the one episode that we have, it's called Sasquatch on the Farm. I, Chad and I both kind of experienced some things out there that made me think that there could possibly be something. Um, and if you go, if you search Sasquatch ATV research team on Facebook, that's our sister page. That's pretty much dedicated to that property and the stuff that happened there. So you'll be able to see some of the stuff that we found. See, oh, wait, oh, damn it. Me and my big mouth. I just missed that part. Let me try and pause it. Oh, damn it. Right there. Every goddamn time. All right, come on, stand up. And try and pause it. So there we go. You can see like from where the butt is down. If you look at a gorilla that walks upright, the the femur or the thigh, the quadriceps, they're not that long. They're they're very stumpy, very short when it gets down to the gorilla knee, and then down to uh, I guess the 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 shin and calf area is even smaller. This looks to be much bigger, and as it gets up, the the torso from the shoulders down to the hips is a little bit more uniform, whereas a gorilla, especially a silverback, has extremely broad shoulders that taper down to a sharp, almost like an upside down triangle down into the hip and buttocks area. This thing is definitely more, more, more even, even evenly tapered on, on both sides. But again, it's just a short clip. I can't really make out good detail. 
Um, yeah, but when it was sitting there, just the actions looked very gorilla primate. And now looking at this frozen, uh, it looks a little bit more narrow in the shoulder than what I would imagine a Sasquatch to be. You know what I mean? The shoulders don't look that big, but then again, it's not the best quality. It's from a distance. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's very like for me watching it on the screen here, it, it's very hard to say, okay, it stood up, but we don't have an idea of the distance from it, the angle, you know, incline, decline from it. That thing could be three foot and the guy's down a slope from it and it stands up and it looks to be five to six foot. Mm -hmm. Now, shoulders and stuff like that, it's so hard for me to pick out like two points to say those are the shoulders and the distance between them. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go frame by frame to see if I can get any more, but you can see where it's crouched down low and then boom. That's 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 a pretty big increase of, of for lack of better terms, height, I guess, to be uh, a gorilla. Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's a gorilla unless it's a very large, tall, thin mm -hmm. built gorilla because if you look at that it's still sloped forward and, and you can still see a bend in the knee so it's not even fully fully mm -hmm. extended yeah it is interesting i mean to see no, I, I, I go ahead i'm sorry i keep no, just, just to see something like that in a more modern you know you know more modern times a video from mm -hmm. 2013 where As opposed somebody, to the 60s, yeah. Yeah, where somebody happens upon something in the woods, not necessarily looking for something in the woods, might have been out hiking. All mm -hmm. of a sudden it sees something, you know, average thought is, oh, it's a bear. Right. Okay, I'm going to kind of hang back here a little way, see what it does. Right. Then all of a sudden it stands up and you kind of get that idea of, yeah, that might not be a bear I'm looking at. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the rest of this video is just a dude. Once that thing stood up, the next frame, he drops the camera down and well, not physically drops, but the camera drops in his hand. He takes off running and all you see is him running through the bushes. Um, this is titled Real Skunk Ape Sighting, and that was posted by Sasquatch Central. They're the that's the video that I found of it. So you guys could go on YouTube and check that out uh, for, for some more detail and, and whatnot and look at it a little bit closer for yourself. So, but one thing that I, I, I thought was kind of interesting is as it was, I'm assuming was getting ready to leave. Um, I'll bring, I'll bring this up if I can is when apes move through water, they don't, they don't go on all four. And they do stand now. Now this this next video that I want to bring up is kind of interesting. See the chimpanzee, as opposed to uh, the gorilla. Let me get it playing here. Well, the legs are still. They you see what they 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 have that shorter upper leg where it goes down to the knee, where it's not a a real long thigh area. And of course, there, there's a notable uh, back end that you didn't see on the uh, the video that we just watched of the supposed skunk ape. Um, but they do walk bipedally through water, which I thought was interesting. Like they didn't stay. Now, now monkeys like baboons and stuff like that that are are primarily quadruped. I I've watched videos with them. They go through on all fours until they reach a certain depth and then they, they might try and stand a little bit, but they still swim. Mm -hmm. But the, the great apes generally avoid water. And when they have to traverse it, they walk upright. They don't go down on all fours. They try and keep their head as far out of water as they can. So I thought that was kind of interesting um, to see. Let me try and stop sharing the screen so it doesn't screw my computer up. So yeah, I mean that 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 was kind of neat. And in popular culture, uh, 
actually in December 2007, season one, episode nine, an episode of Monster Quest, like we were talking about before, was made about the skunk ape. And that, that episode was entitled Swamp Beast. Actually, is one of my favorite episodes. Uh, so you guys could check that out. And um, there is actually an official skunk ape headquarters in, oh God, how, how do you pronounce it? A Chopee, Florida, or a Kopi, O C H O P E E, Florida is where the official skunk ape headquarters is at. Um, and there was also a, in 2012, there was a documentary on the skunk ape by expert uh, David Sheely uh, on the Travel Channel. So if you guys want to look that up too, you could check that out. Um, there are all kinds of reports throughout the south of different kind of bigfoot but the 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 most prominent are the ones that we talked about tonight which were you know the skunk ape and the uh honey island monster and of course if you go a little bit further west you have the the what is the the falc monster the lake worth monster and so on and so forth but uh yeah that's that's about it tonight's going to be a short show because chad's going to be traveling tomorrow and I've got I've got a lot of work I need to do, but that that was our Southern Sasquatch show tonight, and ladies and gentlemen. We hope that you all enjoyed. Uh, and again, we do apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. We we had a late start because we couldn't get uh, some of the mics working, but you know, wouldn't be our show if it actually worked smoothly. Yeah. So. <sighs> what do you think about that skunk ape? <laughs> well, again, it's one of those things like in that video, the person definitely is seeing something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, you know, we kind of can break down what it's not, mm -hmm. you know, but could it be a hoax? Yeah. Sure. You know, could it, you know, but I see that's the thing. I think that's what all these people that come out post-mortem of these other people's claims, oh, it was a hoax, it was this. That's what I was saying about earlier is now we have to sit here and go, well, it could be a hoax and everybody falls on one side or the other. It's completely 100% right. a hoax. And then there's people that go, well, I'm not seeing what people say is a hoax there i'm seeing this this and this i'm seeing articulation i'm seeing movement a certain you know joint ratio bone length stuff like that so i think that's what it really makes investigating so much harder or or breaking down some of this stuff because there there's so many different things that you could point to that oh yes okay i'm seeing this the the thigh bone from knee to hip would be this length mm -hmm. well does that fit a human being does that fit a bear does that fit a, some kind of ape you know but uh, these films are shot in such a not shot in such a way but they occur in such a way that you can't without a reference point like i said is it you know, somebody shooting up an, an incline at it. Is it shooting down an incline at it? Is that thing really only four foot tall? Right, right. You know, I mean, that's been the argument with the Patterson-Gimlin uh, film over the years is, well, without knowing which lens he used at the time and the, the exact distance and all that, the creature could be three foot six inches or right. it could be seven foot. You know, looking at that video at the distance and stuff like that, I would like to say it's at least a six foot creature, but mm -hmm. I have no reference points, you know, in that, in that area to say, oh yeah, well a tree, you know, that tree there is, you know, at that knot or whatever is seven foot, it stood up at this distance. Let's take a, a reading of the slope and everything and figure out the elevation change in, in visual acuity stuff and be able to say, yeah, it was six foot. Six, right, six right. something like that so definitely interesting i think there's a lot of interesting film out there over the years that people have just kind of like passed off because there is such a high disinformation campaign on the whole subject 
you know, so not to get all conspiracy theory, but you know, there's a lot of that. You see it more and more with the UFO ufology and stuff like that. But even with Bigfoot, you have these people that go out and purposely fake stuff to ridicule or make the community look bad. Right. And I don't want to name names because I don't want to give credit to a lot of these people, but there was a, there is a very well-known uh, hoaxer. They, they have the, the, uh, what was it? The Georgia Bigfoot in the cooler, mm-hmm. the Bigfoot body in the cooler that, that they had in, in Georgia, which it actually was a Sasquatch costume and which I think was like pig and possum guts or something like that, that they actually had put in there. And I think, Steve Coles from uh, oh, what the heck is his group? He's from Whitehall, New York area, and uh, he's the Sasquatch detective. If you guys want to look him, look him up. Super knowledgeable guy, pretty cool guy too. I don't know him personally, but I've watched a lot of his stuff, and I I, I think he's pretty awesome. Um, he went down there to investigate and and basically wasted his time, unfortunately. But uh, I think there, no, again, I don't want to name names, but there 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 are a lot of popular hoaxers out there that really go out of their way to pull the wool over people's eyes now anymore whenever you hear their names you know it's not going to be real but yeah it is unfortunate that these people continue to do that because they're 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 hurting the people that are really trying to do this for real they're making us look like even bigger clowns or quacks or or fruit loops or whatever you want to call it um to the rest of the the public's eyes um yeah i don't know some of these that that one video in particular uh that we just watched i actually really kind of like that again it's it's up in the air i can't say for sure that it is a bigfoot i can't say for sure that it's something else i can't say for sure that it's a person in a costume all i do know is that it is interesting with the shapes of the body the head, you know, the 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 fur color and all that, the movements, it's very consistent with a lot of the reports that you see out there. It's also very consistent with a, a lot of um, other primate behavior. And again, if Sasquatch is real, just based off of the reports and the descriptions, I would say that it would have to be 99.9% primate you know, and why wouldn't it mimic primate behavior? I mean, we, as well as the great apes, share a lot of, not just genealogy, but a lot of different traits and how we utilize things and how we perceive things and how we think of things. So I would imagine that it would do all the same things to to survive. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I could definitely, I, I would think, you know, the old the you know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree Mm -mm. you know we all have similar you know stages of development like they they're showing that you know chimps have entered the stone age right right along our same developmental path so they're going to do things differently yes but at the same time they're developing you know slower than us but yet they are developing so we have some similar, you know, activities and actions and emotions and responses to stimuli. So, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. they, they would if they are ape, you know, somewhere in the primate family, they're going to have certain things that are going to match up with us, with mountain gorillas, with chimpanzees, with, you know, in our in that line. So yeah, definitely. I think I would think it's more ape or somewhere in our ancestral line. So it's going to have some things that are going to be shared qualities aqu- across the groupings. Absolutely. So you know, I'd like to you know just point out that I I apologize for the technical difficulties this evening. I did actually turn my microphone on this time, but. <laughs> There's something else wrong with the computer, not reading it again. So mm-hmm. I'm sure if Les and I shut this off and started it back up, all of a sudden it would work for me mm-hmm. because that's, that's always what my luck is. Yeah. So, but, you know, definitely if you're interested in some of this stuff, I'm going to try to, like I said, try to find um, Harlan Ford's book 
his daughter's book about the subject of the you know honey island swamp monster you know if you guys know of any other interesting you know southern bigfoot type stories maybe you could share them with us you know share them with you know share them on the link or the the chat thing because i'm sure other people may be interested in it. and i think it's just a good tool for all of us to expand what we know about this subject and you know find some new you know cool videos and stuff like that because there's a lot of videos out there floating around that don't they they have their hot moment and then they disappear you know right. but you know depending on when you came into the community you may you know you know the patterson gimlin film but you don't know all these other little film clips that have been found over the years or you know came out before the internet was big and yeah they're on youtube but if you don't know where to look you never find Mm -hmm. so it's always cool you know you guys share stuff like that share to the page even you know definitely helps you know just us find new information and, and new subjects and just increases our knowledge as researchers and you know investigators and might you know you may know something you know have something that may help somebody else out along the way who may you know either had a personal experience or is you know trying to learn more about these subjects so definitely if you find anything shared on the page we always you know love to see stuff you guys share and stuff like that also on you can also share to all things strange which is uh one of our other sister pages you know so if you have something cool to post up there throw it up there, throw it on our page. We, you know, like I said, we enjoy seeing that. We also enjoy helping that page out. So that was all I had to say about sharing because sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. Yeah, that's right. I am posting the link to the book. Uh, I believe her name is Dana Holyfield. Is yes. the granddaughter of... Uh, granddaughter, is that what it was? Okay. Yeah, or great-granddaughter, Holyfield, something like that. Yeah, Holyfield there, was there's, last name. Yeah, there's actually two of them. There's the Honey Island Swamp Mon- Monster Documentations. Um, there's another one, Swamptology, the study of the Honey Island Swamp Monster. And I'll post that up there, too, for everybody to enjoy. I think there might be another one. Just for the heck of it, I will put it out there. Uh, swamp Monster Island, a boy's encounter with a legendary creature. Uh, I'll put that one out there too. And that way you guys could go check them out. Um, and hopefully enjoy, get some more info. So on that note, Chad has got a house full of people. Uh, I'm going to let him get back to his uh, company and thank you everybody for tuning in. And again, we apologize for the technical difficulties. We will hopefully be back next week. Um, and until then be safe and keep on looking for monsters. Good night, Chad. Good night, Les, and everybody else. Have fun. Be careful this weekend. You know, enjoy yourself, but don't overenjoy yourself. That's right. Good night, everyone. Stay classy, San Diego.